Exodus chapter number 4 tonight, Exodus chapter number 4. Exodus chapter number 4, this um, message tonight I guess could have two titles. I don't want to give you the other one yet because we will get to it here in a minute. But one would be stand up for others when they cannot speak for themselves. And like I said, that's got another part to it. And we'll get to that here in just a few minutes. But Exodus chapter number 4 we're going to read our text here in just a minute, but there, there's times in our lives as Christians or just as we go through life that, you know, we're asked to step up to the plate. We're asked to take the lead or some responsibility. Um, sometimes it's we're asked to help others. Sometimes we're just asked to be the leader. And Again, like I said tonight, stand up for others when they cannot speak for themselves. And there's sometimes that we're with a wingman, and that sure does help a lot. A lot of times in the Bible, the, even Jesus sent folks out two by two, and um, that definitely helps. It gives us some courage. It gives us some strength. Um, other times, um, no one's present. It's just us. And as Christians, we know it's us and God, and that's all we need. But sometimes when we're by ourselves is when we falter and fail. Um, you know, I understand that there's times in life in business needs and for financial purposes or um, to remain ethical that we have to excuse ourselves from things. And, but probably one of my biggest pet peeves is a lot of times we use that as a crutch in our life to excuse ourselves or say that we have interest in something so I don't want to speak up and say um, something or I don't want to speak up out of place or out of turn and that really concerns me sometimes because I feel like that can uh, weigh heavy on us and can begin to weigh down our Christian life. It can begin to weigh us down as a, a friend um, you know, when uh, Pastor Cody came here, it would have been easy for me to say, well, I want to excuse myself. He's been my best uh, friend my entire life. I don't want to have a say whether he's going to be my pastor or not. But no, I want to step up to the plate and say, man, that's a good man. We need him. I want to step up for him, um, you know, if I've got a chance to help somebody. And I understand there's times we do exclude ourselves, but I think sometimes it becomes a little crutch to us and, you know, that, we need to remember that sometimes God brings us to those places to stand up for somebody when they can't stand up for themselves or to speak for them, help them, encourage them. Um, I hear stories about my daughter at school all the time that um, helps a, a child in need, and it just warms my heart that, you know, I'm, I'm going to brag on her a little bit that she does that. She does that on her own accord. She does that because she's saved. She's a Christian. She loves God. That's something you can't teach. It's just bred into us. It's there. And we've got to be careful. And, you know, there's times that that happened in the Bible. Uh, one of them, for instance, is if you remember back in the life of Joseph was the butler and the baker. And they were down there. They were thrown in prison when Joseph was there. And they learned that they dreamed some dreams. And old Joseph could interpret those dreams. And... Back in Genesis, this is not in our text, um, like I said, we're going to take off for a while here, but uh, in Genesis, um, it said there, it says, Yet did not the chief butler remember Joseph, but forgot him. He says, listen, boys, y'all remember me when y'all go up there and tell Pharaoh that I know how to interpret these dreams. Remember me. You're going back before Pharaoh. Speak for me when I can't speak for myself. But they forgot about him. They forgot he was the one that actually interpreted the dreams. And then later on, there in the story, if you remember, um, the baker got hung, the butler got restored his job, and he said later on in that chapter, in chapter 41 of Genesis, he says, Then the, the chief butler unto Pharaoh, saying, I do remember my faults this day. To paraphrase a little bit, he says, listen, it wasn't me, it wasn't, I remember my faults. There's a man down in prison named Joseph 
He's the one that can help you out. He can interpret the dream. One of the greatest stories about this in all the Bible, and maybe your mind, especially with the Wednesday night crowd, has already went here, but is in Esther. In Esther, chapter number uh, 4, what a, what just a great example of this. Um, Haman had made a terrible plot against Mordecai, against Esther's uncle, and Mordecai had nowhere to turn. That kind of goes back to my pet peeve. I'm very glad that the Bible don't say, well, Esther excused herself because Mordecai was her uncle. The Bible don't say that at all. It don't say, well, now, Mordecai, you're my uncle. And I, the, matter of fact, the king had done put out a decree that anybody that comes into his court unannounced would be killed. So, boy, if that's not reason enough to say, listen, now, Mordecai, I can't just go to the king on your behalf because you're my uncle. Matter of fact, he said he could kill me, so I'm going to excuse myself. I'm going to step back. I don't have a dog in this fight. No, Mordecai went up to her and said, Listen, God's brought you to this place. He's brought you in this famous verse in the Bible. In Esther chapter number 4 says, For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this. And then one of the greatest uh, phrases after that in verse 16, she says, listen, I'll go, but if I perish, I perish. He says, listen, you were brought to the kingdom for such a time as this. I remember when um, Joe Arthur used to preach that um, verses out of the Bible. He'd say, man, step up to the plate, baby, and shine, baby, shine. It's your time. Step up and present yourself. And guess what? It worked out just fine. It worked out just fine for them. So now we come to our text tonight in Exodus chapter number 4. And we meet a man here that you know a lot about. And let's read a few verses here and we'll start breaking this down. So we come here to this man named Moses. So we meet Moses here prior to this verse in Exodus 4 verse 10. We meet him here at the burning bush and he's carrying on a conversation with God. And Moses, we pick up the story in verse number 10. It says, And Moses said unto the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. Now what Moses is talking about here, God says, Listen, man, I got a job for you. I got a big job. You're going to go down to Egypt, and my people's been enslaved down there, and you're going to go set them free. And man, Moses, he starts backpedaling here, don't he? He says, listen, I, I'm not eloquent. I can't speak good. And the Lord said unto him, Who hath made man's mouth, or who maketh the dumb, or the deaf, or the seeing, or the blind? Hath not I the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth, and teach thee what thou shalt say. Now for most of us, that had been pretty good right there. But Moses says, and he said, O my Lord, send, I pray thee, but the hand of him whom thou wilt send. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, And is not Aaron the Levite thy brother? I know that he can speak well. And also, behold, he cometh forth to meet thee, and when he seeth thee, he will be glad in his heart. And thou shalt speak unto him, and put words in his mouth, and I will be with thy mouth and with his mouth and will teach you what ye shall do. Now watch this. He says, And he shall be thy spokesman unto the people, and he shall be even, he shall be to thee instead of a mouth, and thou, and thou shalt be to him instead of God. So here in our text, just to dive right in if you will, Moses, like I said, he's carrying on this conversation here at the burning bush with God. God's got a big task for him. He wants him to go down to Egypt. And the first thing Moses says here is he says, listen, I don't have any ability. And if you look there in verse um, number 11, 
or verse number, yeah, verse number 10, he says, he, or excuse me, verse number 11 of chapter 3, I need to get where I'm going here, we were reading in 4, now we're in 3, so chapter 3, verse 11, it says, and Moses said unto God, who am I that I should go? He said, listen, Lord, who am I? I don't have any ability. I, I don't have any ability, and you know, a lot of times I think we're guilty for that when it it's our turn to step up to the plate or to take our turn or take our lead. Well, well, I don't have any ability. And you hear preachers say that a lot when, they, when they're when they on the uh, pulpit. Uh, Pastor Chuck used to say it all the time. How can a man from Ironton, Ohio, that worked in an iron plant, have the ability to preach the gospel? But it comes from God. Moses said, listen, I don't have any ability. Matter of fact, he went on there in verse 13, uh, verse 13 of chapter 3. He said, listen, I don't even... I don't have the message. I mean, what in the world am I supposed to tell these people? That we've showed up after all these years of them being slaves down there. I mean, what's my message? And God said one of the greatest statements ever recorded in the page of Scripture. He said, God said to Moses, I am that I am sent you. That's who you tell them. They'll know who you're talking about. You tell them I am sent you down there. I'm the great I am. You tell them. So he, he said, well, I don't have a message. He said, I don't have any authority, which the I am authority there should have probably been enough. But So it's kind of funny here. Um, he said, I don't really have any authority. So God gives him a stick. He calls it a rod. He said, there's your rod. That's going to be your authority. You're gonna, we're going to do some stuff with that rod. So there's you some authority. Then he goes on, he says, listen, and what we read in our text, he said, I don't even have any eloquence. I, I'm not, I mean, man, I, I can't talk, I'm backward. I mean, I have no eloquence. Um, I kind of like this in verse number 10. If you think about what we've already said about when Moses said, I don't have a message, and God said, listen, tell them that I am that I am sent you. Moses says in verse number 10, when he says, I don't have no elegance, he uses that same phrase there. He says, oh my Lord, I am not. <laughs> I, I think that's a little humor. He says, listen, I am not. I'm, man, I'm none of these things. I'm not eloquent. I'm, I can't speak good. I mean, I, I'm slow to speech. I'm a little backward. I'm slow tongue. I mean, I got a problem. And I really like this one, number five of this. He says, listen, he didn't even have an inclination of what was going on. I mean, now this is Moses. He's a patriarch, but he said, listen, Lord. He said, man, he said, I don't know who you're looking for, but when you find them, you send them. He said in verse number 13 of our text we read, he said, and said, oh, my Lord, send, I pray thee, by the hand of him who thou will send. He said, man, I don't know who you're looking for, but I'm not it, and you send them. Tell them to go. Man, God, he's, he's like, man, you, you done missed a boat. This thing's went over your head, Moses. I was talking about you. And a matter of fact, the next verse says that. It says, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. He said, listen, that, I was talking about you. I'm getting mad now. I mean, I, I was wanting you to go. I'm, who makes man's mouth? Who makes man to speak? It's me. The same I am that's going down there, so go. And he says, well, since you can't do that, he said, I'm going to give you Aaron. I heard he could speak, so I've spoke to you. You speak to Aaron, and he'll speak to Pharaoh and to the people. See, sometimes we just complicate things, don't we? I mean, can you imagine now, this is Moses, a patriarch, but man, I mean, we done messed up God's plans. We're like, God's wanting to give us the message to give to somebody else, and we're saying, listen, and God says, well, that's fine. I'm still going to use you, but now you tell my message to Aaron, and he'll tell it to the people. I man, that's a bad place to be sometimes. But Aaron's fine he says all right I'm going to stand up I'm going to step up to the plate I'm going to stand up for someone when they can't speak for themselves and listen if you paid attention here Moses and Aaron was just given probably the greatest pep rally ever given in history I mean man they're fired up I mean they have been the this they are pepped up they're ready to go so Moses told Aaron on down in verse 28 and tonight for a uh, um, 
Wednesday night crowd, we're just going to kind of go through our Bible here, and we got a we got a landing place over a few chapters, and we'll get there. But in verse uh, 28 of this same chapter here, of chapter number 4, it says, And Moses told Aaron all the words that the Lord had sent him, and all the signs which he had commanded him. And Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the children of Israel. So, man, they took their pep rally. Moses told Aaron, let's go. Aaron said, grab your stick. Come on, we're going, we're going to battle Pharaoh. I mean, you can't talk. I'll talk for you. You grab your stick and come on. We're going. They're pepped up. Verse 30, And Aaron spake all the words which the Lord had spoken unto Moses and did the signs in the sight of the people. And guess what? Verse 31, And the people believed. I mean, man, they're fired up. The Lord gave Moses the message. Moses told it to Aaron. They've, Aaron said, Moses, grab your stick and come on, let's go. They went down there. They've told the people. The people's believed. I mean, they got this thing whipped. So now, Moses and Aaron is on this journey. And you know most of it, of course, on a Wednesday night, you know the story, and we're going to go through a few of them here. But um, So Moses and Aaron, they go into the court there of Pharaoh, and, of course, their first task, we're going to run a little rabbit here, and we're going to run him down the trail and kill him, but their first task is they're going to go in there, and he's going to throw down his rod, and it's going to turn into a snake. And I always liked this part, and I, I didn't come up with this myself. Of course, it's in the Bible, but I, I remember a preacher saying this one time, and it always stuck with me. And it's good now as it was then, and it's just good to pep us up a little bit. When old Aaron threw the rod down there, it turned into the stick snake. But the one thing you don't ever want to miss about those, and I've told my Sunday school class this before, and it, it always gets me right here, and we've got to mention it, is the devil's crowd, the magicians. They turned their rods into stick snakes too. Now, Aaron's rod, of course, went over there and ate all their snakes, and that, I mean, that's a better ending than that story, obviously. But listen, the devil's crowd can duplicate certain things. You know, there on Mount Carmel, the, when Elijah called down the fire, that old devil's crowd, man, they could call down the fire too. Remember, they cut themselves and was wailing and carrying on and, and he was making fun of him and said, what's the matter? You better go wake him up. Apparently he's asleep. He can't hear you. Listen, that devil's crowd had done that before. They went over to the river and they touched the rod to the river and it turned to blood. But the problem was the devil's crowd, the magicians, could do that too. They went in and brought forth the frogs and the devil's crowd, they could bring forth frogs too. Same thing with the lice and so on and so forth. And that I always don't miss that in that story because, I mean, not that God wasn't in that and he was doing his work and he was, he was working and he had done told Moses and he had told Aaron. He said, I mean, I, I love this because sometimes in life we don't have the pleasure of seeing the future, but in this story God had done told him, said, listen, I'm going to harden Pharaoh's heart. He's, I'm warning you about what's going to happen. He's not going to let my people go, so you're going to have to keep going. And listen... Time and time again, the devil's crowd kept rep reproducing. They kept doing the same thing that Moses and Aaron did, but they was pepped up. They kept staying with one another. They kept believing in God. And it wasn't until that night, on the 10th day of the month, when Moses came into camp that night carrying a lamb, the devil's crowd could duplicate everything they had done. And although that's one stick snake ate the rest of them, that devil's crowd kept duplicating. But the one thing they never could duplicate was when Moses said, listen, you take that little lamb and you put it up, and on the 14th day you kill that lamb and you put the blood on the doorpost and the lentils because the death angel's coming through the town tonight. And let me tell you something, that was the one thing that the devil's crowd couldn't duplicate. It couldn't save them. The blood of the lamb. Devil's crowd couldn't duplicate that. And man, Moses and Aaron, I mean, they're carrying on. Everything's going good. And then things start going south. They come out with a high hand, the Bible says. They got the 
big head, we'd call it. They come out with a high hand. They get to the Red Sea. And oh, here we go. Moses, you've brought us out of Egypt where we at least had graves. We were slaves, but we had graves. And now we've come out here. We don't even have graves. I guess they're just going to throw us in the sea, but we're, I mean, we're had. We're done. Boy, old God said, listen, why, why? Moses said, well, that's fine. I'll speak for you. You can't speak to yourself. God, what are we going to do? He said, don't cry to me. Go forward. Go forward. Moses stretched forth that rod. The Red Sea parted. Went on a cross. You know the stories over and over. They get there. They ain't got no water. We got a problem. God took care of them. They got water. We ain't got nothing to eat. God give them manna. They didn't like a manna, so they got quail. So then we get to the battle. Old Joshua's down in the trenches, down there fighting. Moses goes up on top of the hill. As long as Moses' arms was up, Israel prevailed. They let them down, they lost. So Moses was helping Joshua, somebody that couldn't speak for himself. He was busy. He couldn't speak for himself. He's down there fighting. But then Moses got tired. Aaron and her said, that's fine. Said, we'll hold your arms up for you. It's that progression. That when one can't speak or do or say or whatever for their self, then somebody else steps in. Man, they've got this teamwork figured out. God said, listen, Moses, you can't speak. I'll give you Aaron. He can speak for you. Joshua, you can't fight without me holding my arms up. I'm going to hold my arms up. But my arm's getting tired. Aaron and her said, that's fine. I'll hold your arms up. Man, they got this down to the T. We're going to help each other. We're going to stand up for each other. Standing up for others. Speaking for others. Doing for others. When they cannot speak or do for themselves. Then we come, and boy, we've about covered the life of Moses here, ain't we? We come to Mount Sinai. God said, I've got some important instructions for you. Matter of fact, ten of them's going to go through the pages of history and people still going to fuss about them in 2022. I'm going to give you the Ten Commandments. I want you to come up here and I'm going to meet with you and I'm going to give you the Ten Commandments. I'm going to give you something else that's real important too. I'm going to give you the tabernacle. I told my Sunday school class, as many of y'all have sat and listened and been in other Sunday school classes doing the same thing, it's one thing that was brought out in our lesson that has astonished me ever since. I never thought about it this way. We spend millions and millions of dollars and time and studies and all of it's good and it's interesting in the space program. And... We look at the stars, we study the stars, we send men to the moon, and we do all those things. But most people don't know a whole lot about the tabernacle, about what it represented, about how out in the outer court and you had to labor because you need to be washed because we get a little dirty at times, and how inside there is the table and the candlestick and then you go into that most holy place. It's pretty important. The one thing we spend so much time worrying about and sending people to, God used five little words in the Bible to describe it. He said he made the greater light to rule the day. That's the sun. Lesser light to rule the night. And the one thing we spend a lot of money on and shoot a lot of people towards it says in the Bible, and he made the stars also. Five words. But about 50 chapters in the Bible is given to the tabernacle. What's the difference? Because God was giving Moses some instruction up here that day, and it's very important, and I want you to understand that side of it. It's the reason why I've run that trail, because it was important, because that's the way God could fellowship with man. 
That's the way God could fellowship with man. He said, Moses, I want you to build a tabernacle. And if you study your Bible, it later says he moved from Mount Sinai over to the tabernacle. He wanted to be in there. He wanted to dwell with man. He wanted to be able to commune with man. He wanted to be able to fellowship with man. And that was important to God. He spent 50 chapters writing about that and five words to say the stars. But we're more interested in the stars than we are God and spending time with him. So that stuff takes some time. It took some time to explain to Moses about the Ten Commandments. It took some time to explain about the tabernacle. Pretty important to God. So now we come up to our final verse here in the second half of our, or our, our final chapter in our second uh, half of our um, introduction, if you will. And that's found there in Exodus chapter 32. Exodus 32, if you want to turn there. So, you know, I think it's very important. I think most of the crowd here tonight stand up for others, speak for others, do for others when they cannot speak, do, or say for themselves. That's important. Very important. But, as Aaron is getting ready to learn... He had grown so used to speaking for Moses, he forgot to speak for himself. And that's the second part of our little title tonight that I didn't want to give away, is although we're to stand up and to speak and do for others what they cannot do or speak or say for themselves, we can't do, be so used to speaking for somebody else that we forget to speak for ourselves and stand up for when somebody else isn't around. So our text tonight takes us to chapter 32, and I, I really enjoy this one. But in chapter 32 of Exodus, it says, And when the people saw that Moses, so remember, um, God gave Aaron to Moses because he wasn't very good at speaking. Now, God's up there talking to Moses. He's got some pretty important things, the tabernacle, the Ten Commandments. But Moses delayed to come down out of the mount. So the people gathered, to get, gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us little g-gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we want not what has become of him. So I think you're catching on pretty quick here. It says, listen, we're to speak for others, do it for others, help them, encourage them that can't speak for themselves. But when the time comes, we can't get so used to speaking for others that when the time comes for us to step up to the plate and stand for what's right or to speak when nobody else is around, we can't do what Aaron does. So here they're testing him. They said, listen, Moses, we don't even know what come this Moses. But won't you get up and we want you to make us something. Make us something we can worship. Make us something we can follow. And, Mo, and Aaron here got so used to speaking for Moses, he lost all power to speak for himself. Think about that. All he had to do was say, listen, he could have went ahead and said it because God does here in a little bit. He said, man, you bunch of stiff-necked people, sit down and be quiet. We're waiting on Moses. He's getting us some important instruction. But just like we do a lot of times, the pressure was caving in and the pure pressure and, man, it was coming in tight to him. And verse number 2 says, And Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings which are in the ears of your wives and your sons and your daughters and bring them unto me. And all the people break off their golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, These be thy little g-gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow is the feast of the Lord. And they rose up early on the morrow 
and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings and the people sat down to eat, to drink, and rose up to play. Now notice here what the Lord says. So the Lord's seeing all this go on and poor old Aaron, he's done, got so used to speaking for Moses, he's done, forgot to speak for himself. And the Lord said in verse number 7 of chapter 32, and the Lord said, to Moses, go get thee down, and thy people which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt, they have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten calf, and have worshipped it, and have sacrificed thereunto, and said, These be, I, be thy little g-gods, O Israel, which have brought thee up, out of the land of Egypt. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. He said, listen, that crowd down there, they've already corrupted themselves. They've turned away quickly. And that's what, it's, that's what I'm talking about tonight, is not doing that turn around quickly. It's like, listen, Aaron, I mean, everything was fine while you had Moses. He couldn't even speak for himself. You were speaking for him. But now that Moses is gone, Aaron was so used to speaking for him, he couldn't even speak for himself and say, no, I'm not going to do that. One of the most interesting things, I guess if you've been in my Sunday school class, you should know this one, but one of the biggest interesting parts about this that I never want anybody to miss um, that again, we're going to run another rabbit here and hunt it down and kill it, but is God told the people of Israel as they left Egypt, go spoil the Egyptians. And it's one of those little parts in the Bible you just kind of read over and think, well, that's kind of cool, and you go on, and you forget about it. But we got to remember that Moses is up there on the mountain, and he's getting instruction about how to build the tabernacle. And God's given him these directions about this golden candlestick, this furniture overlaid in gold. Well, man, these people's out in the desert. Where in the world's all that gold going to come from? I mean, now listen, God's good and God, man, he can speak. And I mean, man, he can create the moon and the stars and divide the waters from the land. And I mean, he can do it. But he don't always choose to use miracles. He, he wants to use the people. So where in the world are they going to get that from? Well, they're going to get it from what they spoiled the Egyptians from. But they don't know that yet. Moses is up there getting that instruction on the mountain. He ain't even come down there and told them yet they got to build a golden candlestick. That they got to overlay the furniture with God. I mean, they, they don't know that yet. And, and it's it, this part, when I saw it, it really, it always just, it, it really convicted me because... The people were so quick to turn from Moses and to turn from God and Aaron was so quick not to stand up for what was right and not to speak for himself when Moses wasn't around that they almost wasted the golden candlestick and the things they were supposed to do and the instructions to do with the furniture of the tabernacle on a golden calf. I mean, think about it. God had strategically planned... For them, as they spoiled the Egyptians, man, I got plans for them. Just listen to me. Go spoil the Egyptians. You're going to carry this stuff. Moses is going to come down in a little while. He's going to tell you what to do with all this stuff I gave you. And they almost wasted it on a calf. Gone. The wasted blessing. God had provided everything for his tabernacle so he could dwell with these people, and they about wasted it all. So as we go here, though, God obviously is getting mad. Verse 10 says, Now therefore let me alone that my wrath may wax hot against them and that I may consume them and I will make of thee a great nation. said, I'll just take care of that crowd and we'll just start over. And verse 11, and again, this all ties into what we've talked about tonight. These people that are stiff-necked, have turned away quickly, that's went astray, that now can't speak for themselves, Moses is going to step up to the plate and speak for them as an advocate. 
And Moses besought the Lord his God and said, Lord, why doth thy people, or why doth thy wrath wax hot against thy people, which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? And he goes through an exhortation here. He says, listen, Lord, remember Abraham and Isaac and Israel thy servant to whom thou swearest. And verse 14 says, And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. Listen, Moses hadn't forgot that, hey, you know, somebody stood up for me when I couldn't speak for myself. And now just because they failed, I'm not going to just say, You're right, Lord, let's wipe them out and start over. No, he said, listen, Lord, don't, don't, don't do that. You brought those people out of Egypt. You don't want them to talk about you down there and say you brought them up here just to destroy them. And the Lord repented of the evil he was about to do. He worked as that advocate. Um, again, it's good for us to stand up for others, but beware, don't get so used to doing that that we forget to speak for yourself. Um, you know, there's times in our life that we don't have Moses, we don't have an Aaron, we don't have a Pastor Cody that's standing there. You know, one more story kind of in closing is Joshua. Joshua was there. He saw what was going on, and I think he learned something. There was a time, as you know, in the book of Joshua that later on that Moses, my servant's dead. There's time that there's not always a Moses. There's not always an Aaron. There's not always a Pastor Cody. Moses is dead. It's time for you to rise up and go. I, I think that's why Joshua is one of the great characters because he took that charge. He led that charge. He listened. He paid attention to the past. Because there was a time in his life, and I'm sure you're thinking of it now, that as Joshua got older, the people rose up and decided that might not be the path they wanted to take. Joshua didn't have a Moses. Preacher wasn't standing there. But Joshua stepped up to the plate and said... And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the little g gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood or the little g gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell, but I'm going to make you a golden calf. But I'm not too eloquent, Lord. I can't speak. I'm not anybody. Lord, I don't have a message. Lord, I'm sorry. Them people, they, they pressed hard on me, so I just decided I was going to make them a calf. He said, no, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He learned. He paid attention. He said, listen, when there's not a Moses, there's not an Aaron, when there's not the pastor, he said, listen, I'm going to be sincere. As for me and my house, I'm going to step up to the plate and say, we're just going to serve the Lord. I don't care what you do. I don't care who you serve. I don't care what you do. We're going to serve the Lord. Romans 12, 9 says, Abhor that which is evil and cleave to that which is good. You know, as always, it always... The greatest example goes back to the cross and aren't we so glad that when we couldn't do anything for ourselves, when I was stuck in the muck and the mire and the clay, when nothing I can do can work, man I like to work, I ain't too smart but I, I'll, I'll try to outwork you. Listen, but I can't work my way to heaven, can't give my way to heaven. Grandma's salvation can't get me there. Being a member of Chai Baptist Church can't get me there. So nothing I could do could bridge that gap between me, sinful man, and a holy God. But God's plan was Jesus, our advocate, our go-between, our daysman. 
to become sin for us and to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. So when we have the opportunity to stand up for others, I think we should. When we have a chance to speak for others and to rise to the occasion, I think we should when others can't speak and do for themselves. But in that, we shouldn't get so caught up in used to speaking for other people that when the time comes and there's no Moses, there's no Aaron, there's no pastor that we can't stand up and speak for ourselves.